All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming all the way up to the Aria, or at least I had to make it all the way up here. I've been in the Venetian for like three days and I wasn't able to leave. And I think I just finally saw outside air. So I was happy to make the walk after the rain. Um, Welcome, this is uh, Extreme Infrastructure and Automation uh, with Wavefront uh, by VMware. Uh, Kai over here uh, is from uh, Wavefront and VMware. I am Kevin McGrath, CTO of Spotinst. Uh, Spotinst is the platform uh, Wavefront is using uh, to kind of do their um, extreme infrastructure on AWS right now. So uh, what we're going to do uh, today is we're both going to talk. I'm going to start off. I'm going to explain what the Spotins platform is, which is the platform they're using with AWS uh, to, uh, to run their containers um, on AWS at scale. And then Kai's going to come up and he's going to show you all the interesting stuff uh, that Wavefront does and, uh, and how they use us and AWS together. Uh, real quick, if you haven't heard of Spotins, uh, company snapshot. Uh, we were founded in 2015. Uh, we've done a couple rounds of funding, and today over 170 uh, employees for offices around the world. Uh, what we do is we automate cloud workloads uh, to prove, improve performance, reduce complexity, and lower compute infrastructure costs by 90%. And I'm going to talk about how we do that and how we work with AWS and customers like Wavefront to make that happen. Uh, we have... Uh, Five different products. Uh, we're going to focus on one of these today. Uh, Ocean is the product we're really going to dive down into, uh, but Elastigroup Group and Ocean from this list are the two big products that we use to really do hyperscale applications in the cloud. Uh, Ocean is our serverless containers offering where we manage the infrastructure for you, so you just deploy pods out into, uh, out into your Kubernetes cluster, and then we take care of finding the best compute uh, in AWS, bring it to your cluster, and uh, keep keep uh, keep on the management of that for you so you can continue to just worry about your business operations. So we're running about 3 billion cloud resource hours a month, uh, providing anywhere from 60 to 90% cost reduction. This reduction is off on-demand pricing, so if you're uh, traditionally running production workloads on on-demand, we really specialize in taking those production workloads and pushing them to the lowest cost compute that you can use. Uh, some of the co uh, customers that we're uh, supporting today and then to get right down into it, um, this is the interesting stuff. So this is Spotinst Elastic Group. Spotinst Elastic Group is where Spotinst started. Uh, this is the underlying engine to everything we do to automate inside AWS. Uh, Elastic Group uh, goes out and optimize costs uh, up to 90% by using spot instances. So if everybody knows what a spot instance is in the room, AWS has a few different ways that you can buy compute from them. The first is on demand. You go to AWS. AWS says, hey, it's going to be a dollar uh, to run this instance for an hour, and that's the on-demand price. Uh, a spot price, you go to AWS and say, hey, how about that extra capacity that you're not using, the capacity you're building out uh, in all of your data centers? AWS is constantly building. They constantly have extra infrastructure that they're not using, that people aren't using for on-demand. They sell that capacity at cheaper rates. There's a spot market for it. So um, there's a whole bidding system that goes on underneath that. Uh, they've kind of obfuscated that a little bit, but the bidding system still exists. So you can actually say, hey, I'll pay 10 cents on the dollar to run this instance. Now, AWS will also do auto bidding for you, so you don't have to do that. Spotins will also take care of that. What's great about that is now you're buying compute at a 90% discount. What's not great about that is AWS can take that instance back from you at any given time. And uh, they'll only give you up to a two-minute warning to make that happen. And I'll explain how Elasti Group kind of circumvents uh, some of those rules uh, so we can keep a cluster highly available with the use of Spotinst and keep your production application running on top. So prediction is key. Uh, what I just talked about before with Spot instances being able to kind of like fall out from under you at any given time, what Spotinst is doing is we're monitoring all of these capacity pools that exist in AWS. Uh, every spot market is a little bit different in AWS. So uh, uh, in US East 1, the spot market's going to be different than US West 2. is going to be different than over in Europe. So we're constantly monitoring all these markets. We're seeing where the capacity is. Uh, we're watching interruption rates in every single availability zone. And so we have a, a, a tool, uh, a model on our side that will start replacing instances before they get reclaimed by AWS. So if you're running an auto-scaling group or an Elasti group with 100 instances, if 20 of those are going to go away, we're going to scale you up to 120 instances, and then those other 20 are going to drop off, and you're going to be back at 100. 
And our SLA, uh, which you can see here on the screen, is that we will keep your Elasti Group at capacity. And we will go do that by any means necessary. So if we can't find spot capacity, we will fall back to on demand automatically. And then as soon as spot capacity comes back from AWS, we'll get back into the spot market for you. Uh, so this gives you the ability to run and optimize uh, as much as possible in the cloud. We also use reserve capacity here. If we do happen to fall back to on demand, we also check to see if you have any reserve capacity, any reserved instances, any savings plans that currently aren't fully utilized. And we use those to save you at a reserve capacity price, which is still saving you about 40 to 60%, maybe not up to 90% that spot saves you. Um, so if you do, we're not gonna go too much into reserve capacity in the talk today, but it's yet another way that you can save money from EC2 uh, with AWS. Uh, so yeah, I just talked about uh, utilizing reserved instances and our SLA. Uh, so you can see here that um, in the graph here, we show you that we've scaled up uh, some on-demand running instances. We've kept spot running uh, the entire time. And then when capacity came back, we scaled down the on-demand instances and we went back to spot. Uh, we keep track of any headroom uh, to stay in front of any scaling needs that you may or may not need. Uh, we take into account any regional RIs, flexible RIs, standard RIs, and we also support the new uh, savings plans that AWS just released a couple weeks ago. Uh, we also connect with uh, the, your, any DevOps tool stack that you use. Everything is infrastructure at code at SpotInst. Uh, with an Elasti Group, you can uh, natively uh, hook in uh, with all the tools that you use today. If you use CloudFormation, we natively integrate into CloudFormation. We also integrate into CloudFormation Registry. So we're tightly coupled with the AWS toolset. Uh, we also have an official Terraform provider, and everything is JSON and REST-based, so you can throw it into your favorite CI, CD tool. And then you can uh, manage your infrastructure in AWS and SpotInst at the same time within the same code structure, and it doesn't feel like you're going to two different places uh, to do your work. We fit right into what you do. We're not trying to make you go through SpotInst to use AWS. We're just doing what we need to manage uh, the instances in the most effective and optimized way for you. So, Ocean, what are serverless containers? Um, Spotence Ocean is built on top of Elasti Group, and this is where we're really going to get into today, and this is what is really going to shine when Kai gets on stage. We integrate at um, the controller, the orchestrator level in um, Amazon ECS and Kubernetes, and what we do is we watch what the scheduler needs. And as you are assigning tasks or pods to the orchestration of or whatever can container orchestrator that you're using, Spotence is watching those needs and we're constantly making the infrastructure match underneath. So what we're doing is we're automatically applying certain amounts of headroom to make sure that you have capacity available so you're not waiting for instances to turn up. And then we're also looking at the total capacity of vCPU and memory that you need and associating that to the different markets that are associated with your account. So we're looking, is it best to use a reserved instance for this case? Is it best to use a spot instance for this case? Is it best to be in a certain availability zone? Do you have uh, storage requirements for uh, volume claims, different things like that? And the autoscaler is looking at that all the time. And as pods come in and as pods go away, the autoscaler underneath is taking the infrastructure and right-sizing it and making sure that everything's highly available. What we never want to see in a cluster is unschedulable pods. If you've used Kubernetes and you've been trying to do it yourself on AWS, a lot of our customers have run into uh, situations where they have unscheduler pods, and what they do is they overscale. And what you're doing at that point in time is you're giving the cluster too many resources uh, to uh, uh, circumvent not being able to run the workloads. So what the autoscaler will do is keep the cluster at the exact size that you need it. So why containers, platform independence? You build once, run it anywhere. Um, this is one of the reasons why everybody's moving containers. We're not gonna get too far down into you know, why you should containerize your code. But um, Ocean and uh, our container offerings are, you know, we're seeing the biggest up ramp uh, from customers nowadays. They're lightweight and efficient. Um, they're easy to package and deploy, and they really you know, speed up the whole cycle of uh, deployment. So, 
the underlying infrastructure that we used to use, Elastigroup, where you were deploying you know, code with AMIs and maybe doing like a chef recipe on top of it and everything, that's kind of turned to containers nowadays. And this has really increased the cycle uh, to production. So real quick, just to show you where this fits in the whole picture of the Kubernetes environment, um, you have your control plane. And your control plane is either Amazon EKS, uh, any Kubernetes, OpenShift, uh, Rancher. We integrate with uh, any, uh, any upstream compatible uh, Kubernetes uh, control plane. What SpotInst does is we sit in the data plane. And inside the data plane, we're working with the worker nodes. And we're looking at what the pods need, and we're associating that infrastructure underneath. So we're not managing your control plane, we're not managing EKS for you. You can, you can use COPS, you can use EKS, you can use any, any way you want to deploy the master servers, you can do that. And then we can, we can communicate with that Kubernetes controller um, and, uh, and right size that data plane for you. So as I said before, container driver, driven auto scaling, what we're looking at is we're looking at the pods that need to be scheduled into the system, and as they need to come in and drop on top of your Kubernetes cluster, we're finding, do you need a C3 large, M4 extra large, M3 large? What we can do is we can go out and use the whole swath of what AWS has available instance-wise and bring any instance that's available. And you can control this with labels at the end of the day to say, hey, I want to run on you know, C5 families or I want to pare down the different type of families that I use. You have full control to do that. But because we're going out and finding the best compute for the workload, we automatically use all the instances AWS has available and then just bring the right ones to you. And then you get out of the instance selection business at that point in time. So again, this is just reiterating, bring your own control plane. We integrate with everywhere, 90% of the cost. Uh, one of the features that our customers love is the cost showback. Uh, will you get a granular view of everything that you're running uh, inside Ocean? We give you cost specifics down to the actual container of how much you're spending in the cloud. So when you deploy your Kubernetes cluster, you can actually say, hey, this namespace is costing me $1,000 a month, or this deployment is costing me $2,000 a month, and we associate that with the instances that it was actually running on for the specific period of time. We also look at vertical container auto-scaling, uh, we'll look at how much resources the vCPU and memory was um, allocated for the container, and then we'll see how much that pod or container was actually using, and then give you recommendations that you can automatically apply back to your YAML files to uh, right-size all of your pod deployments so you're not wasting CPU and memory at the end of the day. So this is a diagram of kind of the Tetris auto-scaling that goes on. Uh, you have different pods with different shapes and sizes of CPU, memory, uh, storage requirements. We got to fit this all into the infrastructure so everything kind of pairs together and works well. Containers are the first class citizens here. What we want to do is we want to make sure companies like Wavefront can focus on <coughs> deploying containers and not thinking about how do I make my infrastructure match what's going on. Uh, we can do this with labels. So anything from instance size, type, and life cycle can all be defined by labels that are associated with the pods. Once you associate these labels with pods, we'll take care of going out into AWS and finding the infrastructure and bringing it to, uh, bringing it to the cluster. So for instance, if you need GP, uh, GPUs for some AI or ML, just label it GPU. You can uh, generically label it GPU. We'll find any GPU at the best price, or you can get very specific about what type of GPU that you need, and we'll go find that GPU and maybe the best availability zone and the best price, bring it to the cluster, let you do your work, and then, and then give it back. So no VMs to manage. Uh, no need to choose instance types and sizes. 80% less on your infrastructure costs. Uh, we have, a, um, we have a robust UI. We are really, really adamant about visualization and being able to show you everything in your Kubernetes cluster. 
uh, down to the JSON definitions of the pods and uh, the exact price that you're paying at a very granular lever level. And uh, the autoscaler actually has, uh, we filed with the US Patent Office, but it'll probably be 18 months to five years before we hear back on whether that'll actually be accepted or not. But uh, it's in there and uh, um, uh, we're happy, uh, uh, very happy to uh, have this under a belt. So uh, we also have a very, very good relationship with AWS. Um, uh, this is a partnership here. This isn't like replacing anything with AWS. This is just helping you use AWS uh, to the best of uh, yours and AWS's abilities. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Joshua, who uh, was the general manager of Amazon EC2. He's now, now reports uh, to like a special SVP position. Uh, but uh, you can read his quote here, SpotInst enables customers to move additional workloads to spot instances with less, e less effort and greater confidence. We work very closely with AWS and uh, we have a great relationship. So putting it all together, uh, there's a three layer approach to optimizing and automating container <laughs> workloads. You have your container la la layer, the orchestration layer, you have your infrastructure layer, they all need to come together so you can run uh, as optimized as possible. There's spot, there's on-demand, there's reserved instances. You need to take all of this into account when you're scaling in the cloud. Anytime you're missing a reserved instance or anytime you're running on-demand and not running on spot, when a workload can do that, you're wasting money, right? And at scale, those numbers show up dramatically over time. Uh, we're matching pods to instances. We're taking a very, very deep look at container utilization. And then we're monitoring your real usage every second and making those decisions for you on a second by second basis so you can get moving. And with that, I will end with uh, the SpotInst uh, kind of platform talk. I'll turn it over to Kai and he'll tell you what uh, Wavefronts uh, got running on it. Thank you very much. All right, good luck. Good job. All right. <sighs> Again, my name is Kai and I'm a senior DevOps engineer on the Wavefront team. Um, thanks for showing up. Actually, you guys got me really excited. My heart is pounding here, and I really need to take this moment in to just um, express my gratitude for you guys showing up today. Now, if you're not familiar with Wavefront, we are a time series analytics and observability platform. And what that means is we ingest data from your environment, and your environment can be um, deployed to on-prem or in cloud or multi-cloud. And we, take, uh, we ingest data from your applications as well, and your applications can be deployed in a serverless architecture or server mesh architecture or IoT or what have you. Now the data that we ingest can come in the form of metrics, histograms, traces, or span logs. And we take that data, and with that data we allow you to create alerts or customized dashboards, visualizations, um, all using a robust query language that is very powerful and enables you to make the most out of your data, right? The journey for Wavefront started in 2013, where we were founded. 2015, we exited Stealth. 2017, we were acquired by VMware. And in 2018, we announced our public launch of 3D observability, and that is metrics, histograms, and tracing. We've also got um, span logs to that, so that's actually 4D. Um, and we also announced the AI Genie. And the AI Genie allows you to, um, or allows us to automate uh, anomaly detection and parameter forecasting for you. Now, using Wavefront will lead to the Wavefront effect. And what that is is a, a single unified full stack view of your environment. Um, we've noticed a 30% reduction in tooling complexity. Um, and so what that means is this data normally lives in different silos and is managed by different teams, right? So if we dump all of this data in a single unified view, you can start to see correlations in your data. And you can start to see you know, your infrastructure is really impacting your application, or it's really just an application issue. The query language that we built the platform on allows us to detect issues 10 times faster than without using the platform, all coming in at a cost that is five times lower than traditional APM solutions. And we're doing all of this at scale. So we're ingesting hundreds of billions of data points per day. And we keep this level for 25 months. So if you're sending in data like per second, we never downsample that. We don't scale that down for you. You're getting the full resolution of the data that you're sending in. You should still be asking why Wavefront. And it's because making sense of the data is hard, 
right? If this data is all over the place, like how do you know what's really affecting your application? How do you know if your application is healthy or your infrastructure supporting that application is healthy? You really need a single place to look and a single place to tie these things together, and that's what Wayfront gives to you. Now, hashtag BeachOps is a movement that we set for our team. It's a goal that we set for our team to make sure that we are working smarter and not harder. Right? Everything that you touch, you should make better on the way out so that you continue to improve. Right? The mantra of the cloud is that things can break at any moment, so you are constantly touching this stuff. So make sure that you're making it better on the way out. Now, the graphic on the right here, this is an example of an alert. You can see the, the red shaded area, maybe. That is actually showing you when the alert started, when it, how long it's been firing, has it ended, you know, what's firing. But you'll also see the highlighted text here, and the highlighted text is actually drill down links that will take you to drill down into this alert. This example shows your red metrics, right? So you can see your requests, you can see your errors, you can see your durations, and you can see really what your application is doing. Now, if I scroll down a little bit further on this chart, I can see my system metrics. So this is the nodes, right? In this case, it's showing CPU, it's showing memory, it's showing storage, it's showing network. So just from this view, I can see, is this really an infrastructure issue or is this really an application issue? Again, if this stuff is siloed, there's no way you can find out or you're spending time, wasting time integrating with, or you know, asking other teams, like, what is it? I'm not sure, right? We also boil up the span logs. Span logs are developer logs, um, you know, and configured by the developer to help you troubleshoot um, and shorten that path to resolution. That's really what it's about, is finding out what's wrong faster and resolving that issue faster so that you can work on other things, right? And keep your customers happy. Now, there's always something that sucks, and this talk is specifically like on-call. On-call sucks for anybody, especially at scale, right? You could be like this guy and be unhappy and forced to look at logs like this. Like this is a single scope view at a log and, and this isn't really giving you the context you need to make the right decisions, right? You could be happy. You could use Wavefront and SpotInst, right? I'm gonna let you choose which side you wanna be on. I think it's pretty obvious. Um, now we love Street Fighter in the office. It didn't feel right to have a presentation without, uh, a presentation without Ryu here. This is really to articulate what time series data is. And it's a, a point in time view of your, in this case, it's CPU, right? And you can tell here how powerful visualizations are. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that something happened at the end here on the right. Visualizations are very powerful. It's really the most important thing when you're trying to articulate how an application is working or how your infrastructure is working. You need something that you can show to people and Wavefront gives you the ability to do that. Right? You literally can see everything that you are sending in. You can correlate different things together, like things that you weren't able to do before. We love tacos too. <laughs> so um, this is really an example, again, of showing that what you send in is what you expect to see. Now, could you imagine if one of these little dots was in a different area? Like, that's an anomaly. We've got a robust query language to help you identify anomalies in your environments, right? This is an environment that we monitor, um, and it's got over 100 application services, over 5,000 containers. We're spread across the globe. Um, we've got over 12 Kubernetes clusters. This is kind of uh, stale, but all supporting over 500 users who've built over 600 dashboards and over 700 alerts to monitor their environments, right? Pretty robust. Everything on these next few slides are going to be, this. I'm actually doing more of a, um, architecture review for how we're doing this. Um, needless to say, right, Wavefront is very happy with the support and the, the feature set and everything that SpotInst provides us. I mean, SpotInst was an intelligent choice for us because really it's about unlocking the time that your engineers are spent babysitting things. We call it KTLO, keep the lights on, right? All of that stuff where your engineers are stuck babysitting a Jira queue that they don't need to be doing things that you can automate away. SpotInst was that savior, for me at least. I didn't have to watch a cluster and pick instance type scale up, pick instance type scale down. Very good at what they do and definitely enabled us to move 
faster and iterate faster on what we're trying to do. Now, using Wavefront and Spotins together, as, as I mentioned, we were able to unblock engineers so they can really focus on iterating their code, whether it's infrastructure or applications. We've been able to increase our pace of innovation because of that, right? We can focus on evolving something rather than just supporting something. And we've been able to shorten the feedback loops between our operations engineers and our developers because they're not watching a cluster and figuring out which instances to choose. Um, you know, making those time consuming choices, like you shouldn't be focused on that. I don't want any of my engineers doing that. You guys shouldn't do that either. Your time is worth more than that, right? We've been able to do this and reduce the costs and reducing the costs in the terms of the resources that are actually supporting the cluster, but also managing those resources, right? Again, I'm not managing this stuff. We've got an integration that does it for us and it's just fire and forget. We get to work on you know, building the codes and the pods that are intended for this infrastructure. Now, as I said, this isn't so much a demo as it is a review of the architecture that we have in play. So this is a architecture diagram. I took all of the, because we actually deploy the infrastructure using Terraform. So I went through the Terraform state file and I pulled out all the resources and I just threw them up on the diagram. Now on the upper left, that blue cloud is a, a legacy COPS cluster and we're migrating stuff off of that stuff and, and into this, right? You can see that spot instant wavefront are only two um, of the integrations that we're talking about today. But we've got other integrations that are focused around security, um, focused around you know, uh, bastion access into the clusters. All of these integrations make sense for us and all of those integrations are to save time from our engineers. Any way that you can save time for your engineers is a win. Now this is the code view for that, right? And this is hard to look at. I know you guys can't see it. You're not supposed to see it. Anyways, I'm gonna walk through this stuff. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, if I'm gonna be reviewing the architecture, how do I articulate this in a way that sticks? Right? And I started thinking of the tree view, and then I thought of Bob Ross. And I, I love Bob Ross. Bob Ross is all about you know, mistakes or opportunities. Right? And a lot of mistakes went into making this actually work. And I think progress over perfection is uh, an idea that's very hard for new engineers to um, grab onto. People are afraid for, of critique, right? I think the longer you hold on to this fear for critique, the longer it's going to take for you to grow out of your shell and to really make something um, that's worth sharing, right? Like you need to be embraceive of the bad and the good. So this is the tree that we chose. And this is a, a pando tree. It's actually called a quaking aspen. Um, pando is because it's spread out. And I think as I go through a couple of these slides, it, it'll make sense why I chose this particular tree. Now, the highlighted section here, this red section, I'm going to call this the root for our tree. And I'm going to put it at the bottom here so I can kind of build on this. Now, the modules that are in this code are actually to help access for the, uh, to, to grant access to the clusters, right? It's actually an open ID module so that the user base is managed in Active Directory. And that actually is an example of working smarter and not harder. So instead of my engineer sitting in a queue and waiting for a Jira ticket to come in to um, grant access to a cluster, excuse me, they are pushed to a self-service portal that they can request which cluster they need access to and what level of access they need. Right? So there, because there is only one here, um, that means that I only need to run it once for the account. The, now the next section I'm talking about here is run per cluster. And this is kind of like the trunk for the tree, right? So the trunk is all of the modules that would make this architecture feature complete for a production uh, environment, right? Um, some of the modules I like here are queued to IAM so that your pod workloads um, only access the services that they need from a least privileged perspective, right? You shouldn't give everybody access or you shouldn't give a pod access to everything. Super dangerous. Um, I don't think I need to go into that one, to be honest. Um, but the other one I like here is external DNS. And external DNS is also an example of working smarter and not harder because a developer, say they want to take a, a POC or a proof of concept or something that they're working on 
and they want to uh, publish it on the internet. Like normally that would be a Jira ticket to somebody. Somebody would have to create a DNS entry and you know, that's manual work actually. With external DNS, you just have to update an annotation on the service and the service will create a DNS record for you. Um, and I mean, in a domain that I control, right? So it's still least privilege. An example of working smarter, not harder, right? Um, the next section here is run once per cluster, but this is, these are the optional modules for the environment. And I say optional because we support multiple customers in this architecture. And because of that, they have completely different use cases for their Kubernetes cluster, right? Um, because they have these different use cases, they have, like some of, like Wavefront, for example, we need uh, Bastion host deployed in a different area in a different way than Symfony. Symfony is the other customer that we support in this architecture. So the code is still infrastructure as code. It's still production ready, production appropriate, I should say, and it's deployed where it needs to be. This, those optional modules will give you flexibility in where and how you configure them. And the last section in green here, that is the branches. Well, no, actually that's the, um, the leaves, right? So these configurations here are what make your clusters unique from each other, and that's the cluster name, that's the CIDR, right? That's what region it's in. Um, the CIDR's different because we wanna leave the ability to peer these to each other should we have to, right? The architecture might change, a, a business ask will say, hey, you know, I need this EKS cluster to talk to this EKS cluster. That's why the, the CIDRs are different. Now, the next few slides here are gonna go through kind of some goals that I've set. Um, there's five of them, right? The first goal I wanted to make sure was that I could build a tree over and over again. I could build an EKS cluster over again, over and over again. Um, the red lines here actually articulate that that root is spreading out. I only need to have one to cover all of the clusters in that account. And that's why I chose uh, this quaking aspen. The, the tree is actually one of the largest living organisms on this planet. Um, it can grow up to 1,500 trees, all using a single root system. I mean, hopefully that, that shows why I chose this tree. It's also important to note that the architecture I showed in the beginning with all the lines and stuff, that is the same architecture that goes into these trees, right? They're all production ready, they're all the same, except for the name, except for the cider, but they're all um, production appropriate. The second level is I wanted to make sure that I could build these trees across regions. And there's some special considerations that you need to account for when you do this, right? Like how do I build uh, my image to support these other regions? Things like that, like it needs to be able to scale to multiple regions and we hit that one actually pretty quickly. The next one is to make sure that you can build these in separate accounts. And this is important at least for us because we've got workloads siloed by account. We've got dev stuff and dev and then we have a staging environment and we've got a production environment. But it's important to note that these all come from the same code repo, right? Like these are all production ready environments and they all have the required integrations in Spotence and Wavefront, Scalar, um, things like that. Level four, I set a goal to make sure that we could support multiple cl uh, customers and that's what we did here. So the left side represents our Wavefront, the right side represents Symfony, which is another um, tool or another team within VMware. Level five is taking this work and putting it behind a self-service portal. That's the part of trying to move away from Jira. The, the stuff that you see in Jira should really be architectural stuff, should be things that um, take more work. It should, it, you should really move away from babysitting a queue because of access or because of scaling a node or something like that. Requesting a cluster should be as much as just filling out a form and then they hit enter or, or click on the okay button and it should spin out. We're not here yet. This is a goal that we're actively tracking. And it doesn't stop here, right? Like there's gonna be business asks for other things that are gonna do other levels. I'm not sure what they are yet, but this is how far we've gotten. So again, here's the code structure. Um, and on the right hand side, I have that same code structure, but on the left, I've um, gone into some of the subdirectories so you can see why this works. And it works again because I'm using the same repo. And it works because I'm using symlinks a lot because I want a single place that I have to change in order for that to replicate consistently across the entire forest, right? 
So the first bubble here on the left is that first level. That means you can rebuild your tree over and over again. The yellow lines are actually sim links to a master file. And again, if I change that one file, it's going to reflect changes that are going to want to be made in the rest of the forest. But because each of these clusters have their own state file, then that means that I have a, a specific dev cluster that I can iterate infrastructure changes on, right? Like how many people are afraid of making changes to infrastructure because they don't want to impact somebody else, right? That has no workloads on it. It's literally just to test my infrastructure to make sure it's sound. And then I can roll that out across the forest, whether that's in dev, you know, you can target staging and then prod after that. The second level was across regions. And in the directory, so the, the directory shows regions and then it shows clusters. Uh, the level above that was accounts. So if you're looking at the tree, it goes accounts, regions, clusters. And then the fourth level is the team, right? So you have team, account, region, and then cluster. So you got four levels of abstraction there and you can account for all of that using the same repo. Now, creating a new cluster is actually pretty easy. You are creating a directory, and then you are copying an existing tree, or a leaf in our case, is, which is the, the cluster. You're copying it, but you're using two flags. One of them is dash P, that's to preserve the sim links, and the other one is dash R to keep the recursiveness of the directory. So if you're copying a whole branch, and the branch would be like region and cluster, you take that, and you copy it over, and then you just change that one particular um, main file to say your name, your cider, and your region are, are going to be this now. Now, actually building the cluster, we build it in a specific order. Um, you do the IAM stuff first, you build the cluster next, and then you build the auxiliary stuff, which is all of the integrations that are um, bootstrapped to the cluster, like SpotInst, for example, that would be in the auxiliary module. All the yellow stuff is, uh, again, the the optional modules, and those will make those um, architectures a little bit different depending on which customer you're serving, right? Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the spot instance integration. Um, you'll notice like on the bottom left there, it's got uh, one file for spot inst, and that's important for me at least because I don't wanna be surfing through all of this code to try to figure out you know, what's the stuff that's relevant for spot inst. You throw it in one file and then you know anything in there is for that integration. First spot is the provider, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna uh, ingest a token and then ingest the account. Um, you, you set those two there. We've got data lookups for that, and I've got a, a map to look up or uh, the account number for SpotInst. Next one is a Helm repository data lookup. So SpotInst maintains a Helm chart that we use, and I that's important because I wanna make sure that the code stays um, as close to upstream as possible. I don't want to be doing things that are like non-standard. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm using their latest and I'm using my latest so you can stay close to um, production appropriate. Um, the next resource is Helm, uh, the Helm chart. So again, I'm going to give it the token, the account number, uh, but I'm also going to give it a cluster name. And this is also the spot where you set flags for the Helm chart. So in our case, we don't want to use their metrics um, server implementation because we've got another integration that configures that. And in the last spot, we've got a, the actual ocean cluster configuration. And this is where you configure your node groups, right? Um, if you've got labels that you need to add to the nodes or if you need uh, to set taints on the nodes that can attract or um, you know, push away pods, you, you can manage all of that stuff there. You can manage the headroom. Um, all the configurations for the spot integration would go there. Now, when you're talking about price uh, and value, so it's easy to look at the cost numbers. And, and by the way, to use SpotInst, it's actually a portion of the money that you save. So it's actually kind of free. I mean, I, that's how I take it, right? But the value, um, the additional value, I think the hidden value is the time that you free up from your engineers. None of your people should be sitting there babysitting a cluster, trying to figure out which instance to use, um, you know, which type of instance to use, should it be on demand or, you know, am I making sure that this instance is reserved? Like, you shouldn't be worried about that stuff. You should just be making code to deploy your pods and, and that's it, right? So that was the intelligent choice for us. So just free up the time from your engineers. Your engineers are worth more than that. Let them focus on innovation 
in terms of the infrastructure or innovation for the application, right? Allow them to test, uh, you know, develop new things. Don't, don't let them die in this Jira queue. Now this one's easy to articulate the savings. Um, it shows that we saved about 70% in this case. Um, and that's because we've got a mix of RI and spot instances. Um, yeah, uh, this particular small production cluster, we've got multiple, um, would have cost us 8,000, instead cost us 2,300. And it's because um, it's doing it intelligently. You know, we're not blocking engineers who are trying to deploy a pod because it's sitting and pending. Um, the integration does that for us. Um, these next few slides are all gonna be from the spot ins portal, by the way. Um, we've got a tab for cost, um, and cost can show me um, the cost of your workloads, right? Actually, that last one is breaking out, uh, broken out by namespace. So if you isolate your workloads by namespace, you can see, you know, it, it's good for chargeback. Like, this guy's using this much money, you guys owe us more, or something. <laughs> um, the next tab is right sizing. And right sizing will show you the workloads where you've set, possibly set the limit on your pods too high. Right, so they will land, but they're not running efficiently. So you can see here there's actually some room for improvement. And the right sizing goes a step further and it'll actually prioritize which ones you should attack first. So again, instead of you manually looking through your cluster to figure out which ones are um, lopsided or, or not sized appropriately, the, the integration will tell you which ones you should address first, which is a time saver. Um, you've also got views into the nodes, so you can see how much resources uh, is utilized on the node or reserved through these limits. So you've got uh, CPU and memory. You can see the memory is like 99%. That's awesome, right? And logs will actually show the data or the scaling actions that Ocean is doing for you, right? You can see it's scaled up, it's scaled down, why it's scaled up and why it's scaled down, which is important. Now the, the next few slides are gonna be directly from the uh, Wavefront UI. And this is actually showing the scaling event that I just showed in the log view, right? Like, again, you can see the logs, but it's really hard to articulate. But using visuals, it's super easy. Like, you can see we lost a node. You can see it actually scaled up, and then it scaled back down. This is within 20 minutes. I don't care who you are. You cannot make the intelligent choice on which instance to choose and if it's RI or spot or how to, you know, coordinate that movement within a span of 20 minutes. You just can't do it. It's not a good... Uh, got not a good use of your time. This is a dashboard that we built specifically for Kubernetes and EKS. It's important that because the integration that we, um, the configurations for the Wavefront integration will add that cluster to this dashboard automatically, again, saving time for you. So you can flip through the dashboard and see the different clusters and see, you know, what your utilization is like and troubleshoot, and again, if an alert is firing, you'll see bars of red or bars of orange, depending on the criticality of the alert, on this. And you can click on the chart and you can drill down and get to the alert meat and potatoes so that you can fix it faster. Again, on the intelligent alerting, that red shows you when it started. Is it still firing? What fired? You can click to drill down to that particular host. Um, there's a lot of flexibility here. A lot of, uh, the, the query language is really, really robust. Robust query language. <laughs> We've got um, documentation, very good documentation on the functions that you can use, um, when you should use them. Um, really, it's about asking the right questions of the right data in your environment so that you can make informed decisions, right? And this is the interactive query builder. So if you're not that strong with the query language, and it, it is a lot to take in initially, um, we've got helpers that will, you know, you can filter the metrics um, based on the type of integration. Or, and you can um, use drop-down menus to filter further based on tags um, that you associate to the metrics coming in. And you can also use the drop-down to uh, figure out which function that you want to use um, on that data. And if you don't like reading um, the documentation and if the drop down is not working for you either, we've also got a bunch of videos that will show the most common use cases for Wavefront. Um, how to get data in, you know, how to find that needle in that haystack, we've got a good video on that one too. All of this is on YouTube and available for you to use. 
And again, this is the 30-day uh, savings on the cluster just to articulate again. Um, the cost of using SpotInst is just uh, a portion of the money that you're saving. You're, you're coming out on top. The other part of that, again, is don't waste your time trying to manually scale the cluster. It's just not a good use of your time. And this is the Wavefront Unified View, you know, 30% tooling reduction. These are really the figures that make us um, relevant, right? The fact that we can do all of this at scale, the fact that we're not downsampling any of your metrics, the fact that you know, we're doing this cheaper, faster, is important for you guys too, right? You guys should shorten the path to resolution as much as possible. And when you're using a platform like Wavefront to ingest all of that data, get all the right data in front of you, ask the right questions using the query language is really going to further your product or your plans or free up your time so that you can do the things that you need to do, right? Uh, we finished a bit early. I want to thank you guys again. Um, you guys, if you haven't stopped by the booth, please stop by the booth. Um, we've got our contact information up. You, uh, Kevin, I don't know if you want to say anything else. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> nope. Guys, get my contact information if you've got any questions. Um, you can grab Kevin's too. Appreciate it.